opened the exhibition to the public after many, many years of preparation, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, finally last night. And then we get to talk about it all this morning. So we're going to start with some introductions. We're going to dive into the, um, the uh, questions raised by the exhibition, and then we'll open it up to questions from everyone sitting here. Um, so first, my name is Napa Lilliken. I'm the um, executive director and chief curator of the Museum for Art and Wood. Um, and I would like to, before handing this over to Gina, I would like to acknowledge that um, we're gathered here today in what some people call Philadelphia, which is part of the traditional territory of the Lenin Lenape called Lenin Pipopi. I acknowledge that the Lenin Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with this territory. I affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Tamanen to that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and descendants of the settlers on this land as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. And uh, would you like to say something about the land on which the red oak tree stands at the center of this project? Sure. Sure. So I have to introduce myself? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Gina Siegel. Um, I am the um, artist uh, responsible for To Understand the Tree, which has been a large scale and long term project, which has involved the efforts of, of many people, many of whom are here in this, in this room. Um, and really at the center of this project is a particular place, um, the Midwich Field Station, um, which is uh, in uh, West Wheatley, Massachusetts. It is a research field station that is um, currently owned by Smith College, who invited me to uh, be an artist in residence there. Um, and this is uh, on the land of the traditionally the land of the Nipmuc people. Um, and I just want to say a couple things uh, about the land there, which is that this is a forest. Um, this is a very, almost like archetypal, um, northeastern New England second growth forest. Um, and we're going to talk more about that. But the center of our site is a 100 year old, approximately, um, maybe 80 to the more accurate. Um, uh, red oak tree, northern red oak tree. Um, and it's been at the center of this project, so I just want to acknowledge um, this tree and its importance and the forest around it as we also um, converse with a lot of the human collaborators. I'll pass the mic to my collaborator. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Karen Wellspring. <coughs> I'm a naturalist. Um, I'm a friend of Gina. Um, we, uh, we both live in Western Massachusetts. Um, my role in this project has been um, as a collaborator to um, uh, do what I can to help Gina understand the site dynamics um, in the forest <coughs> where uh, this tree is located. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, how I did that later on. I think I have a mic. Is this mic? Um, I, I'm Vernon David. I'm a composer and cellist. And um, Gina approached me with the idea of collaborating with her on um, on the video. It's um, about understanding the tree. And it was my delight that she did that. Is this working? Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. They don't work as well as they should. Yeah, like all of you. Like, right, yeah. 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 There we go. Like I can hear it. Now. There, yeah. Um, yeah. Did you hear what I said before? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I uh, I had copies of the video, and, and, and there was I put about five cellos on one track, which is um, or, or one digital machine I have that goes with the longer film. Because one of the films um, last year, and Jeannie can tell you more about that than I could. But um, so that was the one that I had a, a, a cello ensemble with, and then. There's a shorter film that's a 10 minute film, and I um, have one cello in that, that, and that one rotates every 10 minutes, and the other is like about 35 minutes long. And there'll be a performance later, but I'll add another cello <coughs> to that. I, I live in Northampton, and that's fine. Anything? Yeah, I'm Gina can orient us a little bit, um, just to start this conversation rolling. Um, there are, in the exhibition, 
there are what we could call a number of different habitats or zones. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you could give us an overview of that so we can you know, sort of know how to navigate ourselves mm -hmm. through. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, you're great. You're really okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I think maybe I'll start by saying there's sort of there's two presences here. There's the project to understand a tree, and there's the exhibition to understand a the tree. They're intertwined and interrelated, and, and they're also not the same thing. And so I tend to talk about them as you know fluidly moving between, but I, I also have spent a lot of time and thought navigating their differences. The project um, was, has been a five-year engagement in the forest, socially and ecologically engaged, um, working, collaborating with Smith College, um, and lots of, many, many people have been involved in this project, ecologists and biologists and um, tree communicator and um, many students and lots of participants, other artists and many clients, as well as our engagement with the landscape itself, with the tree and the forest community. The exhibition is a reflection of the project, but it doesn't intend to encompass the entirety of it. Um, talking specifically about the exhibition, um, should I just kind of like yeah. orient to the work? So, so when you walk in, immediately to the right, there are three works. Um, they're called Living Material 1, 2, and 3. And essentially those works um, are reflections of the life cycle of a tree. So you have a, a red oak seedling, um, which was collected by Kate, um, which is a seedling that grew in the summer of 2020, which was a masked year for the oak tree at the center of the project, which is depicted in the videos. So that seedling is the offspring of that tree, um, representing the sort of birth cycle of a tree. This wedge of wood living material too, with these lines incised every 10 years, just kind of concretizing the growth of the tree, and then living material three are these fractured kind of shards of white ash with the tunneling of the emerald ash borer larvae from a tree that was found by Paul Wetzel this year. Um, and uh, this tree was killed by the invasive insect, the emerald ash borer. That tree is what all the chairs in that room are made from. Um, two trees, but both killed by the borer. Um, these works here are various kinds of carbon studies in contemplation of, of carbon as an element that is in all living things and also is something that we are talking about a lot in this time of climate change. And climate change is really, um, in a way, what motivated this entire project is to really think about how we as humans relate to other life forms on uh, the planet that we share this ecosystem with and how we um, how we can figure these relationships and how we have to think about that right now, in a sense, during this time of essentially ecological crisis. Um, in this area are the works that really reflect the site, and I'm going to say less about this because I want you to talk about it. <laughs> um, but we have the, the herbarium, which is, is uh, collected by Kate, and field notes from both of us, um, reflecting our different experiences of the site and the project. Um, up front, there are um, ghost chairs and uh, shaker uh, variations, sculpt the sculptural chairs, and the one half log divided into a chair and scrap. And maybe I won't talk too specifically about those at this time yet. And in here is the video installation uh, to understand a tree time. The video on the, on the sort of back wall um, was shot over an entire year. So from the summer of 2019 to the summer of 2020, I went uh, to the site at the same time each week, at the same time of day, and I shot from the same vantage point, set up the camera in a particular way, and shot this video, so it covers an entire year of the tree's life. And on the, this wall, there's a single day, which happened to be June 24th, 2022, um, and it was uh, so very close to the summer solstice, dawn to dusk, like a long 16-hour day, shot every 45 minutes. Um, in that room are the ash chairs, um, uh, my own interpretation of a traditional ladderback chair, um, made in a greenwood process, um, the Melii, and um, they are made from ash trees that were killed by the emerald ash borer. Uh, Vernon's music has been integrated into the videos. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> That's perfect lead into the subject of collaboration. 
and I'm going to ask um, um, you, Gina and Kate, to talk about um, one collaboration that's really um, a huge part of this uh, presentation, and then Gina and Vernon will talk about the other collaboration. Um, but first, I, I just want to address this issue of collaboration, what it means, because it, you know, in the woodworking community, um, woodworking traditions are heavily dependent on relationships and the ability to work well with people of other specific um, um, professional backgrounds and skills so that furniture can happen or housing or building can happen. Um, so <coughs> that leads me to, first of all to the question to you, Gina, is how, um, I, I think the, the idea of immersing yourself in a relationship with one tree in the forest has a lot of um, sort of historical and um, connections to American literature, for example, that, uh, that uh, kind of pop into mind first and foremost, but you made a decision early on to work with as many people as possible from, from many different backgrounds in getting, gaining a deeper and firmer understanding of this one living specimen. So can you talk about that decision first? Sure, thank you, yeah. So I think that in, in a way the whole project was inspired by the um, by gaining a deeper understanding of the forest as a community, as a, as a biological community. And so understanding, learning more, and a lot learned from you, um, and many other people who are here, Paul, Joanne, um, Michelle, um, how interconnected everything in the forest really is. And really the, the, the motivation for the question, for, for the whole project was to say like, if we really understand the forest as a kind of complex, interconnected community, what does that mean for those of us who use the bodies of these trees, which are really at the center of this forest community? How do we think about that? I, I felt I needed, as a person who works with wood, a more complex understanding and a more complex way of thinking about that issue. So it made a lot of sense to do that work together with other human community members. I also think that I have, um, as somebody whose roots artistically are in the, the, the discipline of painting and drawing, I have a, a, a lifelong interest in seeing and how, how different people see. And I think why I love working with you is the way that we see when we are out in the forest that we see differently and sometimes in similar ways. And so we've engaged with this place now over a long period of time and we have informed each other through our different observations which are rooted in our different knowledge bases. Great. So, I did just turn this off. You want this? Um, this is up, here we go. Okay. Um, so, perfect. That is a perfect introduction to the relationship between you and Kate, vis-a-vis -vis the project. So Kate, could you tell um, us a little bit about what, I guess, first of all, the initial approach from Gina and invitation to participate, and then how that might have influenced your thinking about your own work. Yeah, so um, Gina asked me, um, she described this uh, project she was thinking about um, uh, back in, was it 2018? Maybe? 17. 17, yeah. started talking about it. Um, oh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a few years before uh, the project uh, began in sort of a formal sense. But yeah, we've been, we've been chatting about it. Um, Gina and I were already pals. Um, we we um, done a bit of collaboration on a, another project um, that Gina had worked on previously. Um, and also Gina and I are people who enjoy taking walks together in the forest. Um, uh, so it's, um, if your background, um, like mine, um, is in the biological sciences, um, and in my case, particularly in field botany, um, to take a walk with a woodworker in a forest is really like, it's priceless, um, because no one teaches you anything in a botany class about like, you know, um, sort of what kind of uh, projects um, are black cherry trees good for, for example, um, that, that seems to never come up. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so of course we have a lot of information exchange 
um, over the years as we uh, as we began um, to work on this this project in a more formal sense, um, I think that we um, you know we spent a lot of time together at the site, um, and we also visited the site uh, separately and made our own sorts of sets of observations. Um, <coughs> when I would go to the site, um, which for many years was um, you know once or twice a month. Um, I would go there, and then more recently, it's it's been somewhat less frequent. Um, but uh, you know, I would make sort of a, a series of observations in my field journal about what I was seeing at the site, and I kind of had a way of um, I had like sort of like a little route that I would usually use when I got there. Um, I hike into the forest, um, I'd walk up to the tree, um, kind of like you know nod at it or something, acknowledge it in some way. And then I sort of walk on this route around um, the site, which perhaps we should explain is um, the site uh, that we worked in is sort of an area, uh, it's a circle with a tree at the center of it in an area um, defined by the, uh, a radius of about 80 feet. Um, so if you can picture a tree in a forest, walk 80 feet out from it, and then walk in a circle around it, um, that was sort of uh, how I would go around the site and just sort of see what was happening there. Um, you know, are the, is it early spring? The leaves are starting to um, uh, burst open on the trees. Um, are the, is the snow starting to melt? Are there frog eggs in the vernal pool? Are there deer tracks? So on and so forth. I make those kinds of observations. Um, and um, over time, I think the way that I did my work did change because of how Gina and I um, sometimes approach the site in different ways. Um, as a you know, as a field botanist, um, no one ever says to you like, "Why don't you just spend some time like with a tree and just not do anything? Like, don't measure it. Don't you know?" Um, like sort of count the number of limbs on it, why not just like sit down and look at it for a while and maybe like take a few deep breaths and see how you're feeling. Um, that's now become like quite a normal thing for me to do, but it wouldn't have been <laughs> if you hadn't, hadn't worked together. Um, so yeah, I certainly feel that I'm now like quite a different kind of naturalist um, than I used to be. This project has been become extraordinarily meaningful. Thank you, Kate. Um, and now let's jump to <coughs> another collaboration, which I think is um, maybe less obvious mm -hmm. when thinking through what would be involved in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And that would be that for, if that wasn't if that wasn't <laughs> obvious. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, well, first of all, I have tremendous admiration and respect for Vernon's uh, practice as a composer and. Uh, as a teacher and as a cellist. Um, and so I began, how should I talk about this? Let's see. So as this was happening, um, as this project got underway in 2018 and 2019, another thing was happening in my life, which is that I got it in my head that I thought I should learn to play the cello. Um, and so I, I had enough experience with uh, classical music in the past that I knew that I didn't want to just study the cello, I wanted to study the cello with an artist who was a, was a creator with the instrument and um, in a way that was, went beyond um, performing, which is not in any way to diminish performing. But, um, so I began to work with Vernon as my teacher at the same time, basically, as this project began. So these two things were kind of intertwined. And I was also very aware the whole time that cellos are these like, amazing um, instruments that are made of trees and that is in practicing uh, every night, or sometimes, mostly every night, um, <laughs> try uh, that the, the resonance of this instrument, the vibrations, are actually coming from a tree, right? And so this is like this really interesting other aspect that was sort of there in the background informing um, this work. And we were also, you know, in our lessons, we were like, our conversation became a very broad ranging kind of artistic process conversation, basically moving from um, 
you know, Bach to the 20th century avant-garde very fluidly. It's really enjoyable. And so um, at the same time, I was making these videos, and I became aware that, that like, to make video in the forest is really different to, than, like, drawing or painting because it encompasses sound. And that the experience of being in a forest is really different in a sensory way than um, to be in a more open landscape, which is really dominated by vision. Because in the forest, you actually can't see a lot. Your, uh, your vision is often obstructed. And so you rely on your ears a lot. And I realized as I was making these videos that I, as I was editing the videos, I was having this weird experience where um, I was uh, hearing a sound in the video and also a birder, so it's like really geeky, like hearing a bird call and people, that's a blue-headed vireo, where is it? But I can't see it because it's a video. So, you know, it was like this weird thing and it made me feel like um, I wanted to kind of augment the, the sound engagement. Um, Vernon's music, uh, I just, I don't know, it's funny, I just always knew that I could just give this to you and it would work. Yes. I just knew that. It's funny, to like, because it was finished. And so, and it, the videos have been shown without the music, and then this was a later edition. This happened the, over the past year, basically. Um, and so I feel like, I'm gonna not talk about your music and let you do that, but I'll just say, I knew that your music would work. So, I'm gonna pass. Okay, this is what um, Yeah, so when Gina approached me with the idea, um, I, I've spent a lot of time in the woods when I was much younger, not, not quite as much recently, but um, I'm very familiar with the feeling of walking in the woods, and I um, spent a tremendous amount of time in Vermont doing that. And um, <coughs> So, it's interesting in the woods, because sometimes it's like being in a cathedral, you know, it's really um, special and deep, and sometimes it's also very much um, Aside from being inspirational, there's also fear, and there's also the unexpected. You never quite know what's around the corner, and, um, and that's part of the enjoyment of being there. <coughs> it's the um, sort of natural unnaturalness about it. I mean, it could, what could be more natural than being in the woods, but there's also this, um, as, a, as a human, like you it's very close to your, um, you know, more original feeling about being. So I tried to bring that in, into the music, and um, I mean the usual type of composition that they do also indulges in in, um, in irregularity, as a lot of contemporary music does. Um, so one of the first things that struck me was not wanting to get in the way too much and, and leaving a lot of space, because I wanted the, the the birds and the animals and the weather and the things that were happening to um, you know, be very dominant. And so this gave me the idea at first of just sort of touching that, like I would, if, if I liked a particular moment, then I, I, I wrote a little something for it. And um, part of the process was also a process of not just paper composing, but, but improvisation in my um, room uh, that, I, that I call my music room. I have an old digital um, tape deck that has 16 tracks on it. And so I watched the film for a while, and whenever I felt like it, or I was inspired to do it, I went in and I, I would, between writing on paper and improvising, I would make um, one of the short moments. And generally they're, sh they're, they're, they're quite short. And then later on with the other film, because this, I'm talking about the longer film now. The other film is a 10 minute film. And I wrote some solo cello pieces to go with the 10 minute film. And the thing that was challenging and interesting about that is that 10 minute film rotates. So if you listen to the whole 35 minutes, that rotates in large over and over again, and so did the short pieces. So I constructed them in such a way that when they struck each other, it, it would become a very different piece. So they, you're kind of constantly listening to um, another piece. And I, I think that that's like being in the forest. I think you, there's something reflective about it, and at the same time, you're, um, you're a little on edge. Um, another thing that was interesting in my process, I think, was um, 
that I spent a lot of time not watching the film. Like, what do you think that you would watch the film? Like, if you're making a Hollywood movie or something, you're going to make music that goes with it. But I found it very, very much more interesting to just see it in my mind, see the, the film. And, and sometimes I, I mapped out how long the film was, and I would just put things in. And it came out much better that way. I think that the, and I suppose if we're talking about learning from the process of doing that, that's one of the things that I've learned. Um, a little bit like uh, Cage and Cunningham did this thing where um, none of the dancers would hear the music until they were performing, which I, I was kind of thinking about too in this. So that I, I worked blind a lot. And, um, and I'm thinking in, in pieces that I write in the future, I, I may try this approach. I was imagining at some point some musicians on stage with these pockets of silence and then they, they do something and one of them does something. I think that that might be actually quite effective. So um, it may change my style a little bit. Cool. But thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a little bit of a question that, that connects more to the direct mission of the museum, but I feel like um, each of you has a very different experience of the material of wood. Um, and so I'm just going to ask each of you to, to respond to that. I feel like maybe I should go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, wood comes from trees, right? Um, trees are plants. Um, uh, trees um, have evolved many different times. Um, like, it, it may seem a bit counterintuitive, but um, not all trees are very closely related to each other, right, um, in an evolutionary sense. Um, trees have evolved more than once in several different kinds of plants. So an oak tree has more in common with a, um, a strawberry than it does with a pine tree. Um, a tree is a um, plant's solution to a problem, and the problem is access to sunlight. Um, so wood is something that plants have evolved in order to um, create a stable structure that allows them to grow tall and to persist um, in places where there are seasons, um, to persist like through the cold, dry season of winter, um, and to be there uh, <coughs> early in the spring the next year to put out leaves. Um, that's all a tree is. Um, <laughs> and yet, <laughs> a tree is so much more than that. Um, we, um, I think we really, um, is, is people, I think we relate strongly um, to trees. We're, we're surrounded by wood our, our whole lives, um, whether you, you know, live in a log cabin in the woods or you live in a high rise in Manhattan, um, there's wood all around you all the time. Um, uh, and I think it, we derive sort of deep meaning um, from it. I, I know as a naturalist, I certainly do. Um, but trees in a forest are, um, what I've come to learn is that they, it's a little bit hard to think of them as individuals. They're so intertwined with other plants. Um, and so many of them, um, uh, they're sort of more than the sum of their parts, I think. Um, but there are many, many parts. Plants are deeply in in interconnected to each other, particularly in a forest. Um, a forest is a place that is full of wood um, in living trees and also in dead trees. Um, in a forest, you are surrounded <coughs> by um, trees, or shrubs, um, woody plants that have died. It's, it's kind of a, a forest graveyard. Um, in a way, but that's just part of how forests work. Um, it's not necessarily a destructive thing. Um, so, yeah, wood is wood is quite complicated. <laughs> it's it could be you know a two-hour long talk. Um, 
Well, of course, I, I play an instrument that's made of wood, and uh, so that has a big influence on me. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm surrounded by the resonance of, of wood kind of uh, consistently. And um, I mean, in the case of my of my cello, the, the back of the cello is very old. Um, so that's an ancient piece. Well, not ancient, it's like 17, um, 21, basically. And so that's a very old piece of wood. I mean, I've gotten so, because I've lived with the cello for so long, I mean, it's not like I'm thinking about it every time I pick it up. But I, I know that it's influencing me. Um, and, you know, yeah, wood is a very fundamental thing. Like, I mean, it's, what, it's one of the first things that we use to construct things. Uh, people made instruments out of it. Um, if I understand this correctly, maybe you can help me with this, but it seems like that it, the root system underneath the ground, I mean, they actually communicate them. I mean, trees are actually sort of in touch with each other. Um, which is a little bit like when you play music and everyone's listening to the music. There's this sort of um, interconnection. So I think, you know, we have a natural attraction to wood, to, to being in the woods and having things made for them. There's so many things I could say. I have lots of thoughts about this, so I'm going to try to limit myself. Um, but a, a memory that came to mind as you were both talking, um, I studied painting with Graham Nixon at the New York Studio School, and we worked uh, with landscape and we worked with interiors. And one thing that he said that stayed with me and it was really present through this project was, when you look at a landscape painting that's empty of humans, and if you see a single vertical tree, you will subconsciously read that tree as a metaphor for a human. He also said at some other point, if you look at a painting of an interior, thinking of like Van Gogh, and there's an interior, a room, and you see an empty chair, that you will read that chair as a metaphor for a human. And so for me, that was just sort of a really nice link um, in this project between the tree and the chair. What, what you were talking about, Kate, wood is a material that evolved to solve a particular biological problem of wanting to photosynthesize more. I want more food. Who doesn't, right? So you want to get higher so you can have more leaves touching the sun. And that, that is actually what feeds the whole forest. It's not just the tree feeding itself, but it's the tree feeding everyone around it, right? The blue jays, the squirrels, the the caterpillars, like everyone. Um, and that, I think through our conversations, I started to realize like, oh, this is what we're doing as woodworkers. We're hacking the solution. We're taking the solution that has evolved to solve a particular problem of getting nutrients between the roots and soil and the leaves, and then the, the, the carbon is being sequestered, which makes the body of the tree larger and stronger so that it can get taller. And then we take that material and we use it in a way that, that opportunizes on how that material has evolved. So the fibers run a particular direction. It expands and contracts across itself in a particular direction. It is hygr hygroscopic. It absorbs water from the air and it releases it. It does all these things. And woodworking has evolved over millennia, as we have discussed, to um, to utilize those properties really well. So it was sort of like this really interesting thing about our interdependence um, with trees. Thank you. And that leads right to my next question, which is for you, mostly, Gina, is uh, the decision to use the chair as the um, <coughs> formal or artistic language in this exhibition. Um, can you talk a little bit about that choice? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think the, this idea to, to, to work with chairs was there from the beginning of the project. And I think that it had to do with this invocation of the human. Um, and I've become a, a little connoisseur of uh, artists who work with chairs in different ways across you know, the last couple hundred years. It's a very interesting topic. I won't go into it right now. That's um, another topic. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> so, um, Chairs as a furniture category, I think are one that is 
uh, we're very like intimate with them in a way. We're all sitting in one right now. I don't think anyone's sitting in a wooden chair. That's funny. Um, usually when I talk about this project, there's like wooden furniture that we're all like standing on or sitting in. Um, but you know, we really like we give our weight to chairs. We have to trust them. There's this kind of like thing, like you have to see a chair and like feel that it will support your weight. Um, I also think you know that chairs. In, the, in their form and structure, there's so much about how our bodies have evolved as bipedal primates. And they sort of like, you know, we can't, we can't actually stand on our feet for that long because we're not um, really that well evolved. <laughs> so, you know, we have to sit down. Um, and then these sort of chairs basically build out our negative space um, as, a, you know, as a seated person. And so that was really interesting to me. The chair is also like a really interesting kind of cultural evolution. So chairs evolved, not unlike trees, separately in different cultures. They evolved in China, um, and they evolved in, I think, the first in Egypt, and then Greece, and Rome, and through medieval times. And so they evolved both in the West and East separately. Um, and so I was really interested in, in chairs as a kind of meeting point of nature culture. The material of the tree being opportunized not in a particular way because of its biology, meeting the uh, physiology and anatomy of the human body. And then you focused on, this is something we talked about a couple of days ago, but you focused on a very distinct um, cultural form of chair that um, has a making history that's really um, quite <coughs> profound, particularly in the context of Philadelphia. Um, and, uh, but it also, the vernacular chair form is, um, is one that is, um, serves our everyday use. It's not, it's not a signifier of uh, class necessarily. It's, it's a basic chair form that would have been used in family or, or work situations. Um, can you talk a little bit about that decision too? Just the history of this particular um, American Eastern coastal Chair. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so so the chairs that I've made for this show are all different variations on um, essentially the uh, what would what might be called the Appalachian ladder chair. So this is a very like it's a folk art, it's a vernacular design form. This is like as you were saying, it's not an elite kind of um, form. These are uh, it's it's in, in a way it's a very refined craft, but it also can be practiced in a kind of like simple way. This is not a virtuosic kind of um, uh, way of working with the material of wood. Um, you know, part of this, I live in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, everything was built, everything there, most of it, was built in the 19th century, I think, in the early 20th. Our house is was built somewhere, somewhere around the 1890s. And I look at it all the time, you know, and it's like, oh, that's hemlock. That's pine. That's and I, I'm just imagining like these are our forests. Those ghost chairs over there. Those are all like late 19th century, early 20th century chairs. Those are our forests. That's where it all went, right? I mean that, and it was exported, and all kinds of things happened to it. But but like when you when you when you look at these things, this is really what this is. And so I wanted to kind of like part of this is really been reconciling with like an environmental. Um, the moment that we're in, and how, you know, what is our accountability to this as a settler colonial culture? So, this is a settler colonial art form. This better back chairs came from England and Scotland to the East Coast, to New England, to Appalachia. And so, I think it was important to me to work with this art form that was really rooted in, like, you know, this is sort of like what happened in North America. Um, and so to kind of take that and contemplate that and reposition it through a different way to put forward as this project. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to ask one, one or two last questions before I open it up to everyone here. I'm sure you have a lot of um, questions for panelists. And um, so first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, one of the questions that's actually raised in the initial text for the exhibition, which is um, the binary between the living tree and the dead wood. Um, I'm sure you all have 
um, I don't know, I've, opinions or, or takes on this, this um, sort of fallacy of, of binary opposition embodied by one material. I can speak to that uh, a bit. Um, so, yeah, um, no, no dead tree in a forest is really dead, <laughs> in a sense. Um, <coughs> the individual tree, um, to the extent that there is such a thing as an individual tree, um, uh, might be dead as a doornail. Um, but it will very quick, like what's left of it will very quickly become infested with life. Um, uh, I can think of a few examples of this on our site. Um, there's one area of our site where there's, um, there's a stream bed. Um, lots of animals like to cross over at this point in the stream bed. Um, you can see it on the, um, the video with the wildlife camera, the, the video with all the animals in it. Um, that's the, the area of the site that I'm thinking about. Um, there's a, um, a tree that tumbled down into that stream bed maybe, um, I don't know, I'm gonna guess 15 years ago, something like that. Um, the tree, uh, what's left of it is covered with moss um, of several different species. It's covered with ferns. Um, it's covered with a few different kinds of flowering plants. It is alive in just about every way that you can think of. The, the interior of it will be full of invertebrates, um, you know, going about their life cycles. Is the tree dead? Well, yeah, the tree is dead, but the tree is also very much alive. Um, there's also a tree in a different part of the site, um, a tree that we call the hotel tree. Um, this tree is still, strictly speaking, living. Um, there's, it's, a, uh, it's a small white pine. Um, there are green needles up on the top of the tree, but it's on its way to being dead. Like, this tree is not long for this world. Um, but um, woodpeckers have made cavities in the tree, quite large um, cavities, where they've been excavating out carpenter ants that live within the interior of the tree. So they're living their lives in there. The woodpeckers are coming and living their lives, um, getting the ants. These big cavities in the, the trunk of the tree that are left are often full of animals, um, including one time um, I happened upon a, a small mouse that was like sort of hiding out in one of those cavities. And then um, a few months later, I came back and looked at this, uh, this tree again and found at the base of it, an owl pellet, um, and when I dissected the owl pellet, I found the bones of the same species of mouse that I had seen hiding inside of it. Um, so, you know, this tree is fostering a lot of life um, and will continue to do so after it actually dies. Um, and that's, that's what life is in the forest. That's sort of, um, is close to a, a good working definition of a forest, I think, as you're ever going to get. It's, it's a community that is self-sustaining and keeps itself alive. Um, yeah, as, as I, was, I was listening, I was thinking that, that um, music never really stops because music is happening all the time. It's just that when you decide that it's gonna be music, then it's music. Um, which is very much like what you're saying about, um, you know, it never really dies, never really goes, it never goes away. Um, and, and the other thing that might relate to that is that, um, like in a forest or like any life, music has evolved also. And um, these, if just dealing with Western music, I mean, there are other very wonderful musics that are not Western musics, and that, that's a certainty. But as music evolved, you know, they began to hear different things. So at first, people sang together. And then people started singing in, in what we call octaves. And then they started singing in fifths and fourths, because fifths and fourths and octaves have a very common sort of feel to them. Then, then they discovered thirds. And they thought, oh, how wonderful. You know, 
so they started singing in thirds. And slowly this evolved into, you know, Baroque music and evolved into music where um, many, many different things are happening at once. When you listen to Bach or Mozart, I mean, it's, it's filled with, um, with a lot of dimensions. And um, in earlier music, there was always a thing that was called a cantus firmus that had a, it's a little bit like the ground of the forest, like there was a, a bass line, and different composers borrowed these bass lines, and, and they were sort of universally accepted as being like borrowed, you know, material that we would borrow, and then they write music over that. Um, so, you know, there are just, there are many things to think about when you, when you think about the relationship between nature and art. And Gina, what would you like people to, being that this is situated in such a, an urban environment, mm -hmm. but we're presenting a different world, essentially, to visitors in the museum, mm -hmm. what would you like them to take away with them when they go? Well, <laughs> I, I guess I, you know, my thoughts about the exhibition in a way are for the the exhibition to be a kind of a forest-like experience in a sense, where it's, you know, a forest is just there, literally, right? And it is materially present, and it doesn't offer meaning, necessarily. Meaning can be made from one's experience there, um, but it isn't predetermined. Sense. And so I wanted the work in the exhibition to be very rooted in the material and to have this kind of ethos of forest. All of these pieces are reflections on themes of, of death in the forest, of the mortality of trees, of carbon and climate, um, of photosynthesis, time, um, and really ultimately, uh, to use a phrase from the environmental philosopher Andreas Weber, poetics of relationship, and that's really at the core. So I would hope that people um, will be able to kind of sense that um, in the work, but also it's intentionally open for people to kind of bring their own experience and relationship to it. Um, I do want to, I want to invoke one collaborator who isn't here, who is our, our close friend, uh, Bernie Bumalis, um, who is a, uh, a meditation teacher and a Buddhist chaplain and a filmmaker, um, who I did an event with last year at the site, um, which was called How to Breathe with the Tree. Because there's been a whole part of this project that's about breath, um, and about breath in reciprocity with trees. So inhaling um, oxygen that's been released by trees in the forest, exhaling carbon dioxide, carbon is sequestered by the tree, and coming to understand that wood as a material is actually breath is a breath of humans and animal life that has lived in the forest. And so for me, realizing that this tree has been sequestering my exhalations as I've been working with it. And Bernadine and I were talking about this, and she asked this question that it first seemed to be like, came from left field. She said, well, I've just been thinking, like, could humans even make art if there were no trees? <laughs> it's like, what, the skeptical, rational part of my mind that usually, like, is like the kid in class with their hand up like that, was like, I don't know what you're talking about. But as I thought about it more, it was like a really, really interesting question. And so then I would use that question in some of the college classes as like a framing question for our class engagements. And it's really interesting what comes up when you put that question to a group of people, to a group of students from different disciplines, from the sciences, from the arts. Um, so what it led me to contemplate, going back to some of the points you made about evolution, it, it made me look into, and, and you helped me with this, um, the deep roots of our involvement as arboreal primates with trees, and the depth of the practice of woodworking and humanity, that humans actually co-evolved with trees, and that we have that imprinted in our uh, physiology, and that the first known instance of human woodworking was uh, before we were even homo sapiens. So in Tanzania, they found stone tools with the wear patterns and fibers of acacia wood. Um, so they know that, that Homo erectus was woodworking. And so that we've co-evolved with this practice. Um, 
in our bodies and in our local I just want to point out how much wood and um, forestry is connected and intertwined with our language. I was listening to how many times you use wood metaphors and ponds, I guess we could call them also. Um, I mean, we talk about rootedness or branching out, um, how, how difficult it is to talk about and explain concepts without invoking the parts of the tree in our language. Um, does anyone have a question for any of our panelists? So Gina, the um, first chair you see when you come into the exhibition is the one for Gina Alexander, and I guess she was very similar in her work with uh, a tree and a chair and, and that kind of the whole green wooding. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And then also on the sign there, it's noted that the whole green world, green wooding uh, world is kind of out of that. It, it doesn't really address her transition as a career later. And so when we talk about the poetics of relationships, yeah. Thank you for that question. It's really, really great. So, um, um, the first chair that you see when you enter the exhibition on your left is called Chair Study Becoming for Jenny Alexander. Jenny Alexander wrote a book in 1978 called uh, Make a Chair from a Tree. And it, it was a book that had a big impact um, in the woodworking world. And what she was responsible for, um, along with some other collaborators and other important people, in the woodworking field was kind of pulling this practice of green woodworking uh, from the like obscurity of history. And you know, this is a sort of folk vernacular form. It's been largely superseded by like faster, more efficient, more industrial ways of working with material. But what green woodworking is, is it's about um, you know, a tree that has been recently cut, still has all of the sort of xylem and flow in it and you know it's still like an active biological um, living recently cut being right and using the properties of, of moisture differentials shaping with hand tools splitting with wedges right so this is like really really raw material um, kind of work and there's a very very specific techniques that one has to use to make this process actually work so this is not this is different from cutting a tree and having it sawn and dried and killed and, and shaping it with machines. And Jenny Alexander was, a, was a, an innovator and a very rigorous documenter um, and teacher, very, very widespread teacher of this form. Um, she died in 2018, and she's a fascinating and singular figure in the field of woodworking, very complex, interesting person. And uh, she also went through a gender transition and became Jenny Alexander uh, late in life. I'm not exactly sure what year, I don't remember, but um, green woodworking is a, it's like a historic, you know, you know, like people looking like immersed in like 17th and 18th century techniques. This is like a community that's really like in some ways immersed in the past. And to have this major figure go through this gender transition, it's very widely accepted, I feel. I'm, you know, it's it's really cool how everyone sort of just is like kind of rolled with this, but I don't feel like it's really focused on. And I, as a gender non-conforming queer person myself, I just wanted to kind of make an homage to this part of her life and to this becoming, this process of becoming and changing and fluidity, which is like how a tree grows. And so I, I just, it was an inspiration. I wasn't going to do that with the, that chair. That was not planned. And I was lining up, I was like trying to figure out how I wanted the rungs to look, and I laid them on there like that, and I was like, that's it. That's the chair. It stops there. So it's intentionally open form and unstable and fluid and open to change. Thanks for that question. Um, first, I'd like to comment that um, it's really wonderful to see your combining your collaboration with such diverse groups here with biology and music, and it's a wonderful thing to see. Um, I have two uh, comments or two questions, and um, the one is you mentioned the uh, uh, cake, is it? Or, yeah, the uh, your loop, and that there was a tree in the middle, and 80 feet out there were other trees. So the first question is, what uh, species, or is this a planned thing? I assume that it was. And the second question is, um, I assume you also did the panels behind you there. 
And I'm just wondering uh, why some of them are still green. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, thank you. I appreciate your question. Um, uh, so in terms of um, uh, the composition of species in the forest, um, uh, in, in many ways the, the forest at the McLeish Field Station is um, very typical of uh, New England forest, Gina mentioned this. Um, so what we find growing at the site, like the species of trees, um, uh, includes uh, red oak, of course, um, uh, a tree that, that Gina um, selected, um, I think because of um, its qualities um, and its representation in traditional in the, like, furniture making. Um, uh, also, red oaks are trees that are um, particularly prolific in supporting other um, species in, in forests. Um, oaks are, are just <coughs> kind of powerhouse trees. Um, other um, species um, include uh, white pine, hemlock, um, a few spe species of birches, um, American beech, um, uh, big tooth aspen, um, black cherry, red maple. red maple, yeah, especially in the wetter areas. Um, and then um, in terms of the, um, the pressed plant specimens, yeah, it's interesting how some of them um, have really retained the, the green chlorophyll in them and others haven't, right? Yeah, so, so for some of it, it probably has to do with the time of year in which I collected the plant. Um, so the, the, um, the big tooth aspen here, um, those I collected in October, so we wouldn't expect them to be green, right? Um, the um, other variation, so some of these are older than others. A few of these I collected just last summer. Um, so we might expect those to be less faded than the others. I think, however, though, that the, probably the biggest contributing factor is um, just that different species of plants have different um, amounts of uh, chlorophyll in their leaves. It's, it's sort of not uniform um, across leaves. Some plants have more um, <coughs> chlorophyll and uh, less other pigment-producing um, components in their leaves. So I think the ones that are really, really bright green, for example, the striped maple there, that's a, that's a leaf that just has tons and tons of chlorophyll in it. It's an understory plant. It, it needs to gather as much light um, using chlorophyll as it possibly can. So, yeah, sure. I think I know parts of the answer to the question that I'm going to ask you, but I'm very curious, you know, the premise of this project was that you would study this tree and as a woodworker understand it, and then you had the question, and then will I cut it down and use it <coughs> to make chairs? And I would just love to hear you talk about the arc of that and how your decision-making process played out. Thank you, Ellie, for that question. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> The original premise of this project was actually significantly different from what happened. The original premise was um, that we would select this tree, we would work with this tree for a period of time in the way that we did, more or less, um, that process evolved also. And then at a certain point I would cut the tree, or more accurately, Paul would cut the tree. Um, and uh, um, I would use the, this tree to make chairs in a fluid process they would be in an installation with video, and that one would sit in the chairs and gradually learn that these, tree, that these chairs were made of the tree, and the whole intention was to really raise a conversation about how we use this material, and how we use materials in general that come from life, from the ecosystem. Um, the process of engaging with the tree, you know, in order to sort of do this, for one thing, I had to learn a lot. I had to learn about the forest, and I thought to understand it in a much better way than I did. Um, and, and Kate helped me do that, and, and Paul and Joanne and many of the people who are here. Um, and also just spending a lot of time there. Just spending time learning, contemplating. In doing that, I came to understand that learning and information were not the only 
kinds of plants that I needed um, to be able to be really in relation to this tree. And I was reading a lot of um, different philosophers, people from different kinds of worldviews and, and cosmologies, um, in terms of this idea of like, how does one actually create a relationship to a living being that is so different from oneself? Right? It's like a, it's a kind of active imagination and intuition. I can't invite this tree out for coffee, right? And we can't talk about our childhoods, right? So I have to um, find a different way of relating to this tree. So I tried a lot of different things, including Joe, cats coming and communicating with the tree with me, and many other ways of, of trying to be in touch with this tree, these tree breathing exercises that I've done and part of that. And I realized I needed to kind of come closer to this. As I did this, I began to, you know, the philosopher Mark Buber, who wrote I and Thou in the 1920s, talks about moving from a kind of subject-object position in relation to another life, um, which he calls the I-it relationship, into a subject-subject relationship, where um, it's truly a relationship of equal, of equal partners, and it's the I-Thou relationship. And I think, you know, <coughs> Understanding and information were part of this, right? Um, natural history, there's a really great essay about natural history as a pathway to relationship. Um, but it's a sort of, it's a frame, it's one frame among many. And as I came into a deeper relationship to this tree, as the pandemic happened, because this project started before that, as the pandemic happened, I was spending a lot of time out there, the timelines got kind of thrown to the wind, and um, also, there was a lot of death in the world during that time, and millions of people died during the pandemic. And I think I was really affected by this, and I started to question, like, I don't know, is this really, is this really the right thing to do? Is this really necessary? And I also started to gradually realize that the conversation I wanted to start through the project was already happening, and like, not a leaf had been touched. So it was really continuing to question whether it was necessary to do this. At the same time, I was very impacted by indigenous um, ways of thinking about this issue. Um, many writers and speakers, but in particular, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote Ready Sweetgrass, which is a book that has become very, very popular, and I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in these issues. Robin Wall Kimmerer is, is a botanist and is also uh, an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, um, rooted in the upper Midwest, um, and she lives in central New York State. Um, she writes very, very eloquently about this issue from both the perspective of a trained Western scientist and um, an indigenous person. And she writes about the, this idea of the honorable harvest in which, um, you know, as heterotrophs, as organisms who can't make our own food, we don't photosynthesize. So we have to consume other beings in order to live, which means furniture, and means clothing, and means food, and means shelter, and, and all these basic needs are actually, all, all of our needs are met by consuming other lives. So the, the question within indigenous cosmologies is not how do we not do this, it's how do we do this in a way that is, um, that honors this I thou relationship. And so this has to do with language and how language works. And this has to do with harvesting. This has to do with practical things like uh, you don't take the first, you don't take the first plant you see of a particular type because maybe that's the only one. So some of these things are very practical, and some of them are more sort of metaphysical and spiritual, including this idea, and this was really the sticking point for me in a lot of ways, that in these ways of thinking about harvesting, whether it's hunting or fishing or cutting trees or, or harvesting plants, that one is supposed to ask the permission of a being before harvesting it. So here I am trying to have, you know, this act of like intuition and imagination and somewhat uncomfortable and strange, have a relationship to a tree. And what an awkward thing to introduce into a new relationship. By the way, can I kill you? <laughs> <laughs> the coffee date ends there. <laughs> so as I was asking this question, I was also really stuck on some points that come from having a sort of Western, secular, academic, skeptical mindset. Like, 
Well, how do I know that the answer I'm getting is, is the right answer? How do, I, how do I deal with something like confirmation bias? Like, I have skin in the game. I'm gonna, I, 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 I'm, I have an exhibition. I, you know, there's, no, there's like no things happening. And then I gradually realized that, I, that that's the whole point, that you always have skin in the game if you want to survive as an organism. And so then I had to kind of confront that. Um, I had to open up my mind to different ways of thinking about this question of harvest. And I um, was pretty stuck on this. I was beginning to feel a sense of dread as the exhibition got closer and I knew I needed time to make the chairs. I was like, this tree's got, if, if we're doing this, we have to do this. We have to cut it. Sides. Yeah, there was a lot of, like, it was, it was quite provocative. And I was doing these class visits with some college classes and talking about this the whole time. And talking with undergrads about an active artistic process. It was quite vulnerable, actually. Um, and undergrads are like, they know what they think. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as this was happening, I was beginning to feel like an embodied sense of dread about cutting the tree that I wasn't being completely honest with myself about. We kept having this daydream about when we were going to cut the tree. And Paul was in this vision, and Jeremiah and Kate, we were all there and other project partners. And because of the arrangement with college, and Paul is an employee of the college and is covered by insurance and everything, and also has the skills and know-how to cut an 85-foot tall oak tree. Um, I envisioned that Paul's there with the chainsaw and this whole thing, and it's like really crazy, and, and we're all there. And, and then there's this, you know, it's not easy to cut down a tree like that. It's a lot of, you know, it's dangerous, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of noise, it's a lot of smoke. And then this tree in my, in my vision, this recurring daydream, this tree comes crashing down, there's this huge crash, and then all these big wide branches take down all these saplings. It basically destroys the site as we know it, right? And as soon as this tree falls, that you and I would look at each other, and we would just be like, that was a big mistake. <laughs> and that was sort of how it was coming to me. And then I talked with various friends, um, with Ginsburg, Ellie, Monica, um, and Jonathan, and in different conversations and Sarah, we really workshopped this idea, and particularly in our residency in August of 2022, I workshopped this idea with you and with, with Monica and Jonathan. And I was like, I really need to decide what we're doing and I need input. So this was another moment of community within the project, of like being really vulnerable about what we are doing, what I was trying to do, and just putting out all the ethical questions and the vulnerability around it. And in that conversation, because of all the things that you said and you all said, I was like, I could see a way forward, I think. I think that's what really happened. I could see a valid, artistically, a way forward that had artistic integrity, that I could continue the project, and hope had always told me that you'll know the right answer in your body. I don't know if you remember saying that. I've said that several times. And in that conversation, I was like, I felt such relief in an embodied way. And I just knew that was the answer. I got home from the residency and I made a meeting with Joanne. And I said, I don't think we should cut the tree. <laughs> and even with all the work that, that Paul and Joanne and Michelle had done to, arranged this with the college, which was not easy, because the college had a lot of very valid questions about what we were doing. <laughs> you, all just, <laughs> you all just really rolled with it, um, and we pivoted. So, thank you. I think that's an enormous statement of people's belief in you and, and your um, integrity. Um, I just wanted to say I think that's the, the way that People sort of joined in the conversations and, and um, collaborations behind this effort. Um, and I remember feeling the same way. I mean, here I have to know uh, with some preparation uh, what we're going to be doing in here. Um, and uh, I just had complete um, belief in, in you as an artist, but also you very much as a thinker. And, um, and as a human, that, that I was, you know, yeah, whatever, whatever Tina picks up is, is going to be the right thing. And, um, and I feel like what's, what's funny is to hear these, these different conversations that I maybe wasn't privy to along the way until now, 
but that, that seems to be have been the stance that most people involved took with you, and I think that's enormous um, reflection on you and your character. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions? Um, we got to hear yesterday Sarah's take on Gina's take of the <laughs> Um, the chair that's made of processed mature process wood, and I'd love to hear Gina's take on Gina's take of that. <laughs> on Sarah's take. Yeah, on Sarah's take. Right. <laughs> no, I don't know what Sarah said. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, so what Joe's referring to is the OSV shaker chair um, that's hanging upside down on the pegboard on your wall, opposite the title. There and so um, you know so as I've been doing this work that's really about uh, contemplating climate and 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 our ecological moment, which is which is quite concerning and quite difficult, right? Um, and as I'm trying to reach for a, a new way of being with it, and, a, and what I hope is a, a better and more balanced way that I. We can kind of try to model or try to speculate or experiment with. I've also been very aware the whole time that I'm doing all this stuff that is not helpful. I'm driving my car to the fuel station, you know, frequently. I'm using um, power. I'm in society. I'm, I'm just living in this world along with everybody else. We're all doing all this stuff. We're in the power grid. We're using fossil fuels. Where, you know, I can make a handmade chair out of a tree that fell from the forest, right? But I can't do that. I can't make a car that way, right? So there's all these things. So there's this paradox of living now. And so that led into, you know, I think that the act of cutting the tree was a, was a way to really talk about that, to kind of frame my own accountability. And once, once the decision was made to not cut the tree, um, I started to think about materials and materiality and the way these this paradox plays out in materials. And so I got really interested in using contrasting the material of the green wood, the oak and the ash that came from the forest, with the most processed wood, the American cheese of wood. <laughs> right. So um, MDF, you know, this is basically sawdust and glue um, put in a press in the factory. OSB is, you know, essentially ground, just, it's ground trees glued together with the resin and a hot press, right? Most of these kinds of things are, are not made in this country. Um, you, it's very hard to, like, how can I take this idea of having a relationship to a tree and a relationship to the material of wood, and how can I map it onto that material, right? It's really a really interesting challenge. And so for me, this use of this material was really about contemplating that and also saying, like, hey, here we are in this world, in this moment, and we have all these practices. And so just try to hold the complexity of that. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's really complicated about the environmental movement can be that it can move, I think, inadvertently into a sort of backward-looking idealization of the past an idealization of a time when, before the extinction of the American chestnut, right? Or, or some, you know, that kind of framing. And I think as a queer person, I have a very, that's like, you know, red flag. Like, it's, you know, the past is not a place that I want to be, actually. Now is the time I want to be. And so, but now is really complicated ecologically, and really scary and really concerning. So I think a lot of the use of these materials has been, so, we have one more question and then we're going to take a break. <laughs> uh, Gina, your last response and also your reference to uh, undergraduates um, uh, sort of made me uh, think um, about something which they might be right about uh, as, as much as they think they're right about uh, is um, that, uh, you know, if 
uh, if we all die, you know, like there's another pandemic and all humans die, trees would be okay. Mm -hmm. But if all trees die, mm -hmm. you know, we mm -hmm. wouldn't be. Um, and so in this basic sense, life on Earth is like, we are kind of the ultimate blight. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to not think that that's the case. Mm -hmm. And so in, in this project, have you come out with some sense of how we should think about a relationship to trees that, you know, despite this great asymmetry, are we useful in some way? That's a great question, thank you, Sanjeev. Yeah, so I think that, um, I, I think it, it is another thing that happens, I think, when, when like you're suggesting, especially younger people often, but it happens for all of us, think about the environmental crisis. It's really easy to kind of go into, um, humans are bad, we're the problem. And that's not entirely untrue. But I think it also rests on that kind of um, dualistic assumption of the separation of nature and culture. And so to say humans are bad, it's like, well, we're, you know, we are Gaia's children too, right? Like, so we are evolved, we are primates, you know, and we live in this way that has, you know, become very complex and somewhat removed uh, in a certain way, but we are actually in nature, we are of nature, we are nature. And so, um, I think there, I think, yes, absolutely, there's a great asymmetry in it. There's a, there's a note in my field notes somewhere where, where I think I say, like, I, I, I need this tree more than it needs me. I will get more from this tree than it will get from me. And so that's a kind of like, there is an asymmetry, and I think part of the, we give the honorable harvest and what I've, what I've been able to benefit from a lot of these indigenous philosophies is to frame um, conscious acts of reciprocity in relation to that idea. So maybe that's one way to think about reciprocity. Thank you. I think that, well, first of all, yes, thank you.